Right. Good morning, uh, Professor Jha. How are you? I am good. Good morning. So good to be on your platform. You know, it's it's nice that uh, the students connect and we get a chance to though virtually, but it's always a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Same here. Manika. Yes, sir. We are we are just about to start. We are waiting for Vinita, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Sri Sri to Vinita ma'am is also uh, is also joining. Uh, meanwhile, I, I yeah, she is she is joined. So I think we can begin with the proceedings for the day. Yeah. Uh, Muskan, please. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I am Muskan, president at Inactus ARSP for the session 2021-22. As we commence our event today, I would like to warmly welcome and express my utmost gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Shivani Kapoor, ma'am, Associate Professor NDIM, Honorable Principal Professor Gyantosh Kumar Jhasa, Dr. Vinita Tulli, ma'am, IQAC Coordinator, ARSP, Dr. Manika Jain, ma'am, Convener in Actus ARSP, and our faculty advisors for joining in and gracing this session with their presence. This enriching workshop has been organized by an Actus ARSP under the aegis of IQEC in collaboration with NDIM. Our college, Admir Ram Sanatan Dhan College, accredited grade A by NAAC and recipient of All India Rank 12 by NIR, is a premier educational institution of University of Delhi, which aims to, which aims to nurture excellence in education. It emphasizes on fostering the quality of human resources and promoting productive ideas that benefit the students. The contemporary the college is concerned primarily with creating an institution in tune with contemporary demands and enabling the holistic development of all its stakeholders. College's exponential growth over the past few years, its emphasis on undergraduate research, entrepreneurial initiatives, skill development, strong industry and institute linkages, and ICT-enabled learning environments are geared towards the facilitation of sustainable and self-sufficient systems as well as institutions. I would now like to share a few words on our society. NACTIS ARSD was launched in April 2017 by a group of five students who were passionate about becoming social entrepreneurs with a vision and a mission to bring about a change and do their bit for the planet and its people. With a head for business and a heart for the world, it, uh, Inactus has been enhancing lives at the global level since 1975. Following their footsteps, Inactus ARSD strives to carry the same vision forward. Our, our society has been growing ever since its inception with highly motivated and determined students along with the support of our teachers. The team induces a spirit of social entrepreneurship, tackles issues that matter, and aims to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals through collaboration with underprivileged communities. Thank you all for your kind attention. I would now like to hand over the proceedings of the event to our convener, Dr. Manika Jaina. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Uh, now it's my proud privilege to introduce our highly respected principal, sir, Professor Gyanatosh Kumar Jha. Sir is a visionary leader whose able guidance and passion has driven Atma Ram Sanatan Dharm College to phenomenal growth and excellence in the areas of teaching, research, co-curricular activities, and social outreach, as is evident from our rankings and accreditations. Sir's commitment and mission to make ARSD a premier educational institute has always motivated all the stakeholders of the college to contribute their best to this mission. We welcome you, sir. I request you to please address the guard gathering with your motivational words. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manika Jain. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, humbled and thankful to you that you have very generously introduced me. Thank you so much. Although all the work, uh, whatever is being done by you people, uh, all the teachers and team members are doing their best to, uh, to take our college in a greater height. Anyway, thank you so much. So, uh, honorable today's speaker, Dr. Sivani Kapoor from NDIM, uh, Dr. Manika Jain, uh, convener of uh, Inactus, Dr. Vinita Tuli, uh, coordinator IQAC, and uh, dear students. So it's a pleasure for me uh, to see all of you uh, in Actus team uh, organizing this kind of workshop under the aegis of uh, internal quality assurance cell uh, 
uh, in the uh, very dynamic leader uh, in the, in our leadership, Dr. Vinita Tuli. So I congratulate you all. And uh, as Muskan has introduced uh, Enactus and their, its activities, I am I'm, I'm very much satisfied and uh, I am in fact express uh, my thanks to all of you that you have done wonderful works in the past also and you have established a very meaningful society in the college. When I remember when four or five students have met me uh, regarding uh, the establishment of enactors in the college, I was very reluctant. I, I thought, what are they telling uh, to me? What to do or not to do? But when I talked to Manika and it took place, and I'm very uh, proud of you that you are doing uh, a very good job because uh, you are not working only for you. You are working for the society. You are in, uh, you are providing some opportunities to the the people who are uh, who are uh, uh, not very rich and well off in fact they are not skilled also so this this is a very uh, novel job done by our students and our inactors team uh, once again i uh, i would like to express my gratitude to ndim people and especially dr sivani kapoor who has collaborated uh, with our enactors for this workshop. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your very, very kind words. And uh, we promise to uh, be, uh, you know, fulfilling your expectations for times to come. I also extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Vinita Tuli, our IQAC coordinator. Ma'am's tireless efforts have always been uh, very keen on making the college the most active uh, you know, institutions in the entire DU circuit. And she is so humble in her attitude, so dedicated to whatever she is doing. Uh, you know, she's sort of a uh, prayer now for all the uh, aspiring uh, teachers and the faculty and the students in the college. Thank you, ma'am, for joining and gracing this occasion. Uh, coming to the main task for the day. Uh, it comes down to our, doc, our, this, our speaker, Dr. Shivani Kapoor. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Kapoor is an associate professor with New Delhi Institute of Management, having a teaching and research experience of around 20 years. Her areas of interest are organizational behavior, communication, interpersonal behavior, international human resource management, and strategic human resource management. Dr. Kapoor has published and presented more than 40 research papers and case studies in countries like India, Florida University, USA, Middlesex University, UK, Tan Wen on Malaysia, Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, I am Lucknow, I am Indore, just to name a few. Ma'am has also won several awards for authoring the case studies. And it's a proud privilege for us at Enactus ARSG to be hosting a session on introduction to case study analysis because uh, it's a call for the day, it's a call, it's a, it's a call for the times that uh, we all sensitize our students on how to deal with the case studies, uh, a concept which is picking up so very fast in the Western world. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, you know, uh, making me part of this whole process. Uh, before I move on, let me quickly give you uh, a few lines about my college where I'm working, uh, New Delhi Institute of Management. It is located in Tughlaqabad Institutional Area. Uh, we are known for providing the finest internship and life projects to our PGDM students. And we have been declared the best in India for industry linkages, students' employability, and corporate environment by all the national commerce and industry chambers of India continuously for five years. They've been declared the best by SOCHAM, CII, and FICI, including All India Council for Technical Education, that is AICTE, Government of India. Confederation of Indian Industries and AICTE, Government of India, jointly declared us as the first and the only mentor B School of India for a period of three years. So we have been very, very active when it comes to, you know, um, case studies, when it comes to life projects, uh, all those uh, aspects. 
I don't want to waste uh, any time and I want to just move on to um, the, the case study analysis. Since it's a webinar mode, so I have already tried to case uh, solve the case, but I would like to have a good interaction from the students through the chat box. Uh, I would request Sudhukto to please uh, stop sharing his screen so that I can share uh, the PPTs. Thank you. I hope my screen is clearly visible. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Muskan. All right. So what exactly is a case? When I talk about a case, case is a real life scenario. Okay. I write a lot of case. Currently, also, I'm working on two cases uh, which are going on. One is on Tata and the other is on Apple in Indian scenario. Okay. So it is, I basically pick up the real life situations when as a writer, I'm writing a case. Uh, they present certain facts and figures, but please understand that as students, you're supposed to draw a lot of assumptions because no business or no person, you know, the best of businessmen with all the artificial intelligence and everything in place, we do not have all the information available on this earth, right? We have our bounded rationality, the limited information and the limited uh, resources that we have. So... A case will present certain facts and figures, but we draw a lot of assumptions. Here, I would like to, uh, you know, highlight one thing, because when I deal with uh, PGDM students and when they come to solve the cases, they approach a case like uh, um, a particular comprehension. Don't make that mistake. Case is not a comprehension. I know I, I come from a convent background since childhood. I've been doing comprehension. So we generally tend to approach a case with that mindset that whatever is given in the case, I have to just stick to it. No, you have to go beyond. So what I generally tell my students is please unlearn that so that you can relearn how to look at a case. The best thing to do about a case is after every line, try to read in between the lines. Okay. Some information that is given, some fact that they want you to draw out of it, the conclusions, the assumptions, okay? That's very, very important. So here, what I want to tell you people is please change that mindset, right? Mindset of being more analytical, mindset of trying to dig into the information that is given. So I, I teach my students that I, I keep telling whenever you're approaching a case, let these questions keep ringing in your mind. Why, when, how, what, who, why, continuously. After end, every paragraph that you read, you should apply these concepts. Okay, since uh, case study solving is both an art and a skill, so you'll improve the more cases you solve, better you'll become. But to teach you certain tricks, you know, you should always read the case at least three times. Don't think that you've read the case once and you know everything. So read the case once, try to highlight the main points, reread the case from the question perspective, okay? What are the issues? What are the problems that they want you to solve the case? Another trick about case study is, always when you're reading a case, think you are a protagonist. You are the central point. The whole thing lies on you now, okay? And, uh, okay, before I go ahead, let me just uh, talk about a very funny case, and it's a very interesting case, which came in front of a problem, rather, a decision-making case, which came in front of Ford Motors in US. So Ford got a, a problem. The case goes like this, that Ford got a problem, uh, and the subject matter of the problem was that my car is allergic to ice cream or vanilla ice cream, okay? Now, this was a funny thing and a company like Ford, yes, uh, it has shut down its uh, performance, its uh, unit in India, but Ford is a, is a well-known name all over the world. It's, it's a success story, okay? Uh, so Ford people were pretty perplexed at what kind of problem it is and how to solve this. But this is a company which is known to have good years, you know, it always listened to its, its customers. So they put the people to work. So uh, the, the team went to this particular owner, uh, a delighted customer, a happy customer. And Ford was his, this particular car was his repurchase. So obviously that customer was very, very important. So they asked him, what is the problem? 
And the problem was that this family had a tradition of eating ice cream every night. And uh, uh, the, the whole family would decide on which flavor they're going to eat that day. And once the flavor was decided, the man of the family would go and pick up the ice cream. With all other flavors except vanilla, there was no problem. But whenever he picked up vanilla ice cream, the car would not start. It would start giving problem in, in starting and he would have you know, a tough time. And this happened multiple times. And so uh, he, he started thinking that the car is jinxed. It is probably you know, allergic to vanilla ice cream. And then that is why he wrote this mail. Now, the people who had gone to dig in this particular case and take a decision, they were also pretty perplexed that why is it happening? Now, these people were from R&D, from operations, from marketing. So they all got down to work. Uh, they started making a logbook to the tune of which uh, petrol pump he was getting, uh, going to fill the diesel, at what time he was starting, at what time he was closing. And they kept on doing their research. After 15, 20 days of their continuous research, do you know what was the problem? Can anybody write the answer in the chat box? I really get some funny answers when I do this case, you know. So students, quick on the chat box, uh, on the Q&A, if you can just write the answer. What was the problem? Was it jinxed? It did not like the smell of vanilla ice cream? Anybody who can just, you know, put it in the, in the chat box. Okay, no answers. Student brain is not working. Aaj ka badam dose nahi khaya aapne apna. I thought uh, Atma Ram College students are very smart. No? Prove me wrong. Okay. So I do have one answer. Let me just say, due to vanilla essence. So you also feel that it was jinxed and did not like the fragrance of vanilla essence. Okay. Uh, the problem was a technical problem. The problem was with the vapor lock. Now, see what was happening in the case. The case was that uh, if you if you can just recall any mom and pop store or uh, you know or any layout of a departmental store. High selling products are always kept in the front, okay? So vanilla ice cream is the most selling uh, ice cream. That flavor is sold maximum. So it is always kept next to the cash counter, the fridge just next to the cash counter. Every time when he was going and picking up vanilla ice cream, the time taken to go and pick it up and pay the cash and come was very short. And the vapor lock was not getting enough time to cool down. And that is why it started giving problem in starting. Whenever he would buy uh, chocolate or strawberry, that was kept always at the end of the store. So he had to walk, pick it up, come back. That gave max uh, uh, ample amount of time for the vapor law. Now, this case became a classic case for Ford because it had uh, three different perspectives. I think one was for the R&D people to work on the technology so that these issues do not arise for a brand like Ford. Second was for the operations people that how they can improvise. And third was also for the marketing people to make when they're, they're uh, you know, uh, introducing a particular technology, they should make their customers aware that what could be a flip side or how under what circumstances that the technology works best. Okay. So the point here that I want to bring here is that any situation or any case can have multiple aspects. As, as uh, you know, when we teach cases from strategic management perspective or from general management perspective, we teach you to see things from different, different angles. This morning, I was doing a case on perception because I teach HR and OB, okay? So that case has multiple aspects, but I picked it up from the perception. Then, as a student, you're supposed to approach it from one perspective. So tomorrow, if a company comes and asks you to solve a case, if it's a finance company, you should look at the case from the finance perspective. If it's a marketing company, the same case can be given to see from the marketing perspective, okay? But you should not put yourself into any watertight compartments, rather see things from a, a 
a broader perspective. Moving on to some good news about the case, and um, I've already addressed this issue uh, that uh, the case uh, should be read several times to understand it properly. But the, the thing is, in cases, there is nothing like a wrong answer, okay? Uh, yes, you could be more convincing, okay? That could be a better solution. But we do not outright reject anything as this is a wrong answer. The success of your answer or, you know, whether it's a right answer or a wrong answer purely depends on how well you convince the reader with your logic, with your assumptions, okay, that you've drawn. So that is why reading a case and drawing correct assumptions is important because your solutions will totally depend on the uh, assumptions that you've drawn, the conclusions that you've taken out from the case. Now, how, how actually you do it? As I said, any case can have multiple issues, but the case will have one issue or two issues which will be prime issues. So as, as a author of the case and as when I teach how to solve a case, always identify that one issue. There are a lot of success stories, okay? So what led to success? Today's case also that I'm going to solve with you people in detail is a success story, okay? Though the incident is one of the worst incidents that India has ever faced, but what we learned from that and how it was successful, it is the case on Taj attack, okay? The Taj Mahal palace attack. But what, what was the learning for the HR and the, the top management is phenomenal from that incident. So we'll be addressing that case. But what is that one issue or one problem or one success, reason for success, you'll have to identify that, list it out, and then come to those issues which may not be that important, okay? Uh, once you um, get hold of that main problem, I think so, uh, you, uh, you, you're already halfway because then you'll be able to understand and solve the case in, the, in a much better manner. One thing uh, that students generally miss on because you're doing a theoretical thing, uh, something on white, uh, black and white, is the last, this last point, okay? Generally, students get into uh, the, the scope web of uh, what should be rather than what can be, okay? So there are two things. One is the ideal answer. Okay, the organization should do this. But is the organization in a position to do it? For example, for a startup, you, you very easily recommend that, okay, does the, the startup should appoint a consultancy firm, maybe an international consultancy firm if it wants to go, if it wants to go international. But does the startup has that kind of funds? Probably not. So what should be and what can be are two different aspects. Don't, since it's a, since you're writing something on a black and white thing, you know, it's a paperwork, you should not focus on should be. Rather, your focus should be what can the organization do in the given circumstances. Let's move on to the case and let me start with the case. Uh, um, I, as I said, it's already a solved case. So we'll see the solved case, but I would definitely like to dig in more and the backend thing that we did after this case was, you know, uh, was made public and we were able to look at the case, okay? Uh, one thing, uh, can you hear the, the sound or no? Is the sound now there? Speak yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, on the 26th of uh, November 2008, as you just heard, uh, a group of 10 terrorists attacked the city of Mumbai, what used to be called Bombay in India. Uh, they broke up into teams. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. My mistake. Sixth of uh, November 2008, as you just heard, uh, a group of 10 terrorists attacked the city of Mumbai, what used to be called Bombay in India. Uh, they broke up into teams to attack about a dozen different locations. 
One of those locations was the iconic, beautiful, 103-year-old Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in South Bombay. For three nights, two days, there was absolute havoc in that hotel. Guests were terrorized, people wounded, shot, killed. Um, this group of uh, terrorists with automatic weapons, um, plastic explosives and grenades and backpacks roamed freely through this old hotel. Many of us, uh, many of you, witnessed or saw some of that coverage on television at, at, at home. Uh, let's take a closer look. The evening of November 26, 2008, was a typical busy Wednesday for the Taj. More than 500 guests were registered at the hotel. Another five to 600 were attending functions in banquet halls or sitting down to dinner in the hotel's 10 restaurants. Shortly after 9 p.m., an explosion rocked the Leopold Cafe just around the corner less than 200 meters from the Taj. Two young men pulled out automatic weapons and began firing. Crowds at the Gateway of India and along the street in front of the Taj panicked, many rushing the doors of the hotel. In the ensuing chaos, two heavily armed terrorists circumvented the metal detectors and entered the lobby. They were soon joined by the two attackers from the Leopold who broke through a back door. 9.35 or 9.40 was the first call I got from one of my chefs. And he think some shooting is taking place. A person has been shot dead outside my restaurant. Then we heard another gunshot and I said, I told him on the phone only, I said, just close all the kitchens, all the restaurant doors. They were banging the doors. They were alerting everyone, come out, otherwise they'll shoot you. There were a few guests. The, who, you know, they were scared and they came out by putting their hands up, like, and they started hitting them, they started harassing them. It was horrible. The situation, the entire scenario was very scary. We couldn't uh, judge at that time ki what is exactly happening in the hotel. It was a literally boss situation. You can hear grenade lobbying around, you can hear the gunshot also. We did not know the scale of the attack, we did not know uh, what exactly was going on, where they were uh, at that moment. And there was total chaos. My colleagues were trapped with guests in various places, asking me what, we, what should we do next. So picture what's happening um, inside that hotel. There are uh, 500 guests who are registered at that hotel this night of uh, 26th November. There are a an addi additional 600 or so guests who are in various restaurants attending various banquets and functions. There are about 600 or so staff members on duty that night. Young people, many of them very young, 20, 30 year old, some of them, had, the staff members had only been working for a few years at this hotel. Um, many of them um, fathers and mothers, uh, the sole breadwinners in their families with, with children at home waiting for them. One of the things, we don't know a lot about the detail uh, about what happened there, but one of the things we do know is that all 600 of these employees knew all the back routes. They, they knew the exits, they knew the entrances, they knew the hallways and the kitchen galleys in other words, they knew how to get out and how to get out fast. All the research we have in psychology would tell us that the natural human instinct at a time of terror like this is to flee. So think about it. Okay, one question to the students. How many of you think would have fled? So he just told in the case that there were 600 uh, employees and they all knew the way and the attack has taken place. So from the employee perspective, how many would have left the hotel? Just write the answer or maybe percentage. 
I'm getting some answers here. 50%. Okay. So, uh, somebody said none. Okay. Less than 10%. Okay. Anybody else who would like to make a guess? None. Less than 10%. So this is, this is the kind of answer that I, I'm getting. Okay. Around 20%. 50 out of 600, Deepika is saying, okay, uh, we say 40%. Uh, okay, so the answer is that none of them left, okay? And that is where the case lies and that is where it was an eye opener for the HR and OB people that how Taj has been able to inculcate this kind of, you know, uh, feeling this kind of employee engagement, this kind of commitment. Uh, you know, people uh, resort to a different kind of deviant workplace behavior. They want to spoil uh, the property of their, their companies or they misuse the property of the company. And here, there's a set of people who are not paid so high. They are not in defense that uh, who come here to give their lives. But in a, in a glamorous job, you know, uh, people join hotel industry or hospitality because of the glamour that is there, five-star culture and, you know, those kinds of air conditions, uh, building all the time and, and the kind of uh, fan flare that is there. And here the case lies. Let us, let us see the case. What, what you would do. So when I teach this case study at Harvard, I ask my students, I say, how many of these employees do you think fled and how many of them do you think stayed? And they'll hazard guesses and, and the maximum they say that would stay would be maybe, maybe a quarter, 150 or so, you know, but that's, that's the maximum. Everybody who can run away will run away. Well, the truth of the matter is that nobody ran away. They all stayed. In fact, some of them not only stayed, they helped guests out and came back in to help more guests. It's an amazing story. These are some of their stories. The staff of the Taj stayed on duty throughout the siege, calming frightened guests and assisting in their rescue. Many even came back inside after leading guests out of the building. Members of the hotel's team of telephone operators, originally evacuated, voluntarily returned to their stations and stayed on all night. They became the hub of communication uh, at that point. They were the ones calling every single guest room, talking to the guests and telling them to stay in, don't step out, lock your door. As the terrorists roamed the halls, Telephone operators instructed trapped guests to pull their key cards to turn off the illuminated occupied button in the hallway outside their doors. The attack started at 9.30 in the evening. Till 4 o'clock they were answering guest calls. I think that speaks a lot for a hotel under attack. Among the guests at the Taj that night were members of the global board of directors and senior management team of Unilever who had gathered along with their spouses to honor incoming and outgoing CEOs. So we had this really um, elaborate seven-course meal, and that was sort of the setting, the mood, there was warmth, there was laughter, there was a perfect setting for, for a nostalgic farewell and a perfect setting for a nice welcome. And I heard what seemed to me, which is an untrained ear, like firecrackers in the hotel. We started getting these text messages and phone calls, uh, there were some gunmen on the loose. The only logical thing to do was to close the doors and uh, just stay put. Malika came to us and said, we think there's a problem, we're not sure what exactly it is, but I request all of you to be on the ground right now. The, the level of calm and composure that the staff displayed was amazing, was absolutely amazing because they had the presence of mind to even advise us saying, couples please separate, don't stay at the same place, just be in different corners of the room. 65 lives at stake, so can't take a chance. So obviously we were in touch with security all the time and uh, had a lot of alcohol in the room. So that helped a little. This went on the whole night. We were on the floor with our hearts in our mouths, 
with debris falling all around us, the noises of you know firecrackers all around, and all through the staff kept their composure, kept coming to us saying, do you want some water, do you want something? Well, I was scared, but uh, there was something more important to be done. And this went on till four or five in the morning when the room filled with smoke, so we had no choice but to find a way to escape. The entire corridor outside the hall was on fire, so there was no way we could get out. The fire guys were outside and they were dousing the fire on the sixth floor. And we happened to see Mr. Kang downstairs as well. So he sort of ushered the fire guys to us. Uh, we sort of climbed onto the ledge and did some stuff which in today's normal day I wouldn't be able to do, but we sort of came onto the ledge, climbed down to the ladders which by then the fire brigade people had come. The staff insisted that we would go first, guests would go first. And they kept like that till all of us had come down and then they all came down. Well, in a way, because I was there, I was looking after the function, I was, in, I was responsible. I could have been the youngest in the room and I know at one point of time I was the youngest in the room, but uh, I was still doing my job. The easiest thing for our staff to do at that point in time was to drop whatever they were doing and run out of the hotel. Not one did that. Not one. I come from an army background, not myself, but my father, who was a, he retired as a general in the army. And he used, often used to say, when I was even appointed here as a general manager, he used to often tell me that you are now like the captain of, captain of the ship. And I think that's the way you think, that, that you, are the, you are the captain of the ship, and uh, if the, you have to be the last one to leave, and if it sinks, you sink with it. At some point, our kitchen brigade uh, decided that it looked like a lull in the thing and they could be taken out from the back of the kitchen through the fire exit to the back road. And our chefs had formed a human chain to escort people in the darkness down those stairs. And as hundreds of them were being evacuated, somehow two of those terrorists got to know that this was happening. And the terrorists arrived there and saw these uh, chefs lined up, herding people away and there was mayhem. They cut loose and that's where we lost, uh, we lost our biggest numbers there. Uh, we had five or six of our chefs gunned down, but they took the bullets. Said that they risked their lives in just making sure the guests were safe. I don't think we would have made it out of the hotel without the, the support, the assurance, the constant, uh, you know, service orientation that the staff provided, without doubt which is why we will continue to be so grateful to them. I can't explain it. There were no manuals, there were no uh, instructions for what should be done under the circumstances. And so what seems to have happened is individuals, from the waiters to the managers of the restaurants, all had this uh, goal of uh, let's get the guests to safety. To reiterate, 500 registered guests, 600 guests in restaurants and banquets, like that Unilever Boer event that you just heard about. 600 employees. So that's 1,700 people that night. Of those 1,700, over 1,600 escaped safely. Only 34 people died. Of those 34, fully half were staff members at the hotel. So when we were working on this case study, I asked senior management how this happened, why this happened. Okay, so the same question now. What do you feel after listening to this case? How Taj is it being able to inculcate this kind of commitment? What is, what is leading to it? Any idea, anybody? What do you feel? How are they able to, if you, if you would heard um, uh, Malika Jagat, is only 24 year old, okay? What is 24 year? Maybe 
two years, three years of work experience that she had, or maybe less, okay, because she was a banquet manager. So I'm sure she must she must be having some formal education, okay, in, in hotel industry. And she she kept on saying that um, I was the youngest, but I was responsible, okay. Inculcating that kind of feeling, that kind of commitment, which in OBHR we say organization commitment or employee engagement, okay, or the organizational citizenship behavior, right? Uh, that uh, I cannot take a chance, 65 lives were at stake. So she kept all those guest lives before her own life, you know. What can anybody just type in what is coming to their mind? Otherwise, we'll move on. So quickly, we can see what students are thinking about. No, uh, maybe they were just scared, uh, Rithik is saying, and they don't, don't want to go out. Well, uh, if, you, if you heard the case, there were a lot of them who went out and then they came back again. And when uh, the, uh, you know, if you would have heard the, the vice president of HUL talking, she said the guest ensured, uh, the, the employees ensured that we move out first. They insisted that we move out first rather than they moving out first, okay? They must have been good to their employees and must have inculcated in them moral values, okay? So, uh, Smritika is talking about that moral values and how, uh, you know, they have inculcated. I'll talk about these moral values because, you know, one company cannot inculcate moral values in one or two years. Our moral values are developed from the very beginning. So yes, this case is about HR and how they recruit. That is very, very important in this case. See, being good to employees, Oberoi's had faced a similar kind of situation but their employees did not behave in the same manner. That is why Taj became a case and Oberoi did not became a case. They are both are in South Bombay, if you, if you know a little bit of our Mumbai. They both are in South Mumbai. They both are five stars. They are one of the best hotels in our country. Okay, very, very famous brands, but they both had different experiences when it came to employee behavior, okay? Mm, yes, uh, Go with you're talking about their commitment towards work, but how to inculcate that commitment is a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, lesson. Every company wants to do that. So Rajdeep also talks about responsibility and accountability. Every company wants to inculcate, but how to inculcate is is the uh, the um, aspect. And Nilisha talks about during recruitment, they look of, of passion, empathy more than anything. That's absolutely right, uh, Nilisha. I'll talk more about it, but let's first see the case, okay? So I'll dig a little more, but let's see what he has what to say. What explains the behavior of their staff? And these are young people. Malika Jagat, the banquet manager for the Unilever event, whom you saw speaking, 24 years old. What explains it? And you heard, they can't explain it. Senior management, Mr. Ratan Tata, head of the Tata group of companies, they own the Taj Hotels. He couldn't explain it. So I teach this at Harvard. I, come, I bring this case study back and I teach this at the Harvard Business School as a case study of leadership from below. You know, we teach usually about leadership as being something from the top that filters down. This is, this is leadership from below. It's just amazing. And I asked my students, how do you explain it? And they have plausible explanations for the behavior of the employees. Some of them say, well, it must be the culture, the national culture of India. You know, it must be something in the value system there that explains it. And in fact, there is. It turns out that there is a, a, a value or a belief that says a guest is to be treated like God. When a guest enters your home, treat her or him like God. Atiti Devo Bhava in Sanskrit. Other students say, no, 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 it's not national culture, it's corporate culture. If the Taj Hotels is owned by this family, the Tata group, they have a long history in India of very benevolent human resource policies, uh, a, a family of, um, of integrity uh, in, in their business dealings. It's the, national, it's the uh, corporate culture. And others say, no, it's not that. This happened at a hotel. It's the industry culture. It's hospitality. Employees are trained to serve customers. So that's what's going on. All of these are very plausible. 
So along with another colleague, I decided to go back into the Taj Hotel company records to try to understand their human resource policy. Who were these people? Who, who were these staff? Where did they find them? How did they recruit them? How did they motivate them? How did they train them? And I learned lots of really, really intriguing things. Let me share, in the interest of time, just three of them with you. First, about recruiting. You know, they recruit their first line, their front line employees from high schools, not from the major cities, not from Bombay or Delhi or Calcutta or Madras. They recruit them from small towns, Haldia, Chandigarh, Nashik, Tiruchirapalli, small towns. And they recruit students, graduating students, for attitude, not grades. They ask their headmasters or their teachers, who are the students that you teach who have the most respect for older people, for their parents, for the teachers? They're not looking for the people, the students who do the best in grades, but rather for attitude. Then training. This is fascinating. You know, you've heard of brand ambassadors. Lots of companies, many organizations perhaps uh, you, that you represent, train their frontline staff to be ambassadors for the brand, for the company. You know what they do at the Taj Hotels? They train their frontline employees to be ambassadors for the customer, for the guest. It's very different, it's counterintuitive. They call them guest ambassadors. They believe frontline employees should be the voice of the client, of the customer, of the guest, to the company. And third, and perhaps most importantly, their motivation system, their reward system, incentives, is not just monetary. They, they pay about average, a little above average in that hotel sector in, in India. But they reward people with recognition, personal recognition. So when an employee does something that delights customers and the guest writes a note, within 48 hours that employee is recognized. 48 hours. They don't have to wait for a Diwali or a Christmas bonus. It happens within 48 hours. Amazing. In fact, they won the International Hermes Award for an innovation in human resource management for, for this STARS program. So let me, let me close by asking you to, to think a little bit about the lessons that you take away from this, from this company far away on the other side of the world, the things that we can learn here in America, that we can bring home, that we can scale to American businesses, American organizations. Things like the way customers are treated, building a customer-centric, guest-centric corporate culture, organizational culture, Rethinking the relationship, the contract between employer and employee. And finally, let me close by saying this is an amazing inspirational story that something that was supposed to be a symbol of terrorism is today a beacon of hope. Thank you. Okay, so we've gone through the case, we've seen, we've seen few learnings from the case, okay. Let me just dig in more about uh, the kind of uh, case that it teaches. And since I'm teaching you case analysis, students, it does not end here. See, when he talks about the culture, okay, that culture of the country. So culture of the country remains the same, whether it is Pataj or Oberoi's or any other uh, hotel, but every hotel employee does not depict the same behavior, same commitment. So, okay, it is contributing, but it is not the sole reason. There's something else, okay? So what else is that? The culture that the organization has developed. The Taj group of hotels has developed. Then he talks about uh, how to develop, how to develop uh, employees who are, you know, voice of the customers, plus developing employees as leaders, okay? Every employee here, if you would have heard the case properly, uh, even Mr. Ratan Tata, the head of the organization says, I don't know how it happened. There were no manuals. There was no training. Nobody is trained, you know, uh, when we go through all these kinds of mock drill sessions, it is for fire, it is for other emergencies, but nobody goes through a, a terrorist attack mock drill kind of thing, okay? So nobody's prepared for it. Nobody knows. 
but every individual behaved like a leader how are they able to inculcate those leadership skills okay that is very very important and how they are able to inculcate values let me show you some of the facts that uh, uh, taj has been adopting and now today other organizations after this incident after this case have also started adopting so once they recruit the lower level when i'm talking about lower level i'm talking about waiters uh, there's so many other people who work which forms the major chunk of the workforce in hotel industry so there are three things that they look for one has already been told uh, sorry uh, apart from uh, going to small towns rather than picking up from uh, uh, metropolitan cities going to small towns because the value system of small towns is very very different the way people look the way uh, uh, children are brought up okay the way they look at things is different another thing that they do is when they are recruiting they do not look at the iq rather they look at three aspects that is respect for elders so once you respect elders you automatically start respecting your customers okay so it is something that is inculcated in you from the very childhood no organization can inculcate it in 2 to 3 years once a person is matured grown up and starts doing a job okay so that's one important trait another trait is being happy now being cheerful means not only in in positive situations but also in adverse situations because hotel industry is a very demanding industry there are a lot of typical type of you know people who come different kinds of people and once they come in a service sector they are very demanding customers are very demanding in in service sector okay so cheerful how cheerful are they whether they are able whether they are happy they they think positive this ultimately see help them uh, when they were facing a terrorist situation being you know positive and staying calm over and again the whole case you must have seen uh, the the uh, people saying that uh, the employees kept their calm and composure so that's cheerful and they are needed so that they respect their job okay the money that they are getting for the job and the livelihood that they are getting from it they should respect and what is the system that they do is once these people are selected uh, there are six residential taj group training centers they send them to these centers they are paid very meager amount at that time the, uh, the training is for 18 months so of course this 5000 7000 keeps changing as per the time but the whole idea is that they are not paid too much just enough for their pocket money and all those who are very needy are actually able to save all this 5000 because in a hotel industry you get uniform you are you stay your stay is free and your food is free so food clothing shelter is taken care of and if you just want to send the whole amount to your family you can start spending it sending it so first year uh, it's even lesser and second year they increase it this is for the lower level people when they are doing recruitment okay for the senior level people they do not go to iims to select people so which is a clear cut indication that they don't want very brainy people rather they are looking for more soft skills rather than iq okay so rather than the intelligence they are looking for more of soft skills so what they do again here they go to two tier cities and two tier uh, institutes to pick up the the managerial level people okay and again what do they check so of course domain knowledge they do take check about if you are into marketing you should have the basic knowledge of marketing if you are you are into hr you should have basic knowledge of hr apart from technical skills what is important is sense of values integrity ability to work consistently okay that's that's very very important to always put guest first okay these are the traits that are already there in the employee when they are recruited to respond beyond the call of duty you cannot say i'm done for the day okay so just just go beyond the duty never ends okay and work well under pressure as i told you it's a very demanding uh, job right so these are the things that they look into when when recruitment is taking place now a lot of companies have started changing their recruitment procedures in order to have better employee and employee commitment then another important thing is which i talked about and which the case also talked about how were they able to develop leaders leaders at the grassroots level okay so the grassroots level leadership is through the mentoring program 
from their mentoring program now we talk about mentor mentee you know all multinationals are adopting but taj group adopted it way back 60 years back okay 1960 they adopted the mentoring mentor mentee program another thing that they talk about is that people are not supervised this is a very common mistake that this case teaches us which most of the companies do is for new recruits they start supervising them to micro level and when they supervise them they are not able to develop leaders they are only able to develop employees who can execute things when orders are given but cannot take a decision when they are left on their own so you're not able to develop leaders okay and that is one of the important things that taj does right at the beginning so when their training programs is going on they are only asked you know uh, two questions okay so employees must know what to do and how to do it so these are two things that uh, are they are being trained and that is why taj was able to handle this situation in such a good manner okay and uh, when we dig into the case and analyze the case this is what we learn and when their training is going on and they meet every uh, week the two answers that are asked to every employee is what did you learn this week and what did you see this week okay so how observant you were by, uh, by seeing your supervisors people around you and how did you learn from them so this is how they actually develop uh, the um, employees and the leaders well this is some additional information on what kind of skills uh, taj people look into when they are doing recruitments this might be um, an interest to some of the candidates who wants to make their uh, you know career in, in in taj so they do of course look into technical skills they they um, you know they look into uh, the personality because at the end of the day it's a very glamorous industry so you have to be presentable you know shave properly done hair properly tied up girls should know basic uh you know make up things and you should they're not talking about beauty but being presentable okay there's a difference between being beautiful and you should knowing uh, how to carry yourself and customer handling so here the whole last point is about the soft skills you know the interpersonal skills the teamwork being a leader on your own now whenever we come to a case i hope this case has given you some understanding that how do we analyze the case since we were in a webinar mode not face to face we didn't have the facility of usually when we are doing a case when we are solving a case we send the material uh, of the case uh, prior to to the discussion day and then we have open discussions on the case right and um, but since that restriction was there so i thought of doing this video case with all of you where solution was already there but the fact remains that when we are in a in a corporate world any situation that uh, is going around or anything that is going around you know we can learn a lot nobody could have thought before this case that we can learn something to do with human resource uh, by a terrorist attack okay but this case became an uh, a very very important case and it's a very important case in hr cobi and a lot of organizations have learned right before i end my session today i said that a case can be seen from a, from different perspectives so i would like to finish uh, this as a small case which i i teach uh, from the uh, perspective of empathy and emotional intelligence i'll just show you the case of course we'll not solve the case uh, but have a look at this
Okay, so when I teach uh, emotional intelligence, I use this case as a, as a part of uh, empathy and elaborate on it. Um, my CSR team can use, other departments you can use this case from a different perspective, maybe CSR, maybe perception, okay? So as I said, any case when you're analyzing, you can see it from different perspectives and learn and they get to. But the fact remains that you'll have to apply the concepts that have been developed and uh, that are present where already research has been done, okay? So with this, I, I finished my uh, session today. And if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. All right, I think so we can finish uh, this today's session, right? And uh, thank you very much. That's all from my side. Okay. Uh, no questions at all. I mean, I think it was a very beautiful session. So we can have some more learning if we ask more questions. That's a plight of online teaching and learning. I mean, students have become very complacent. So uh, you have to right. actually coax them to ask something. Uh, Muskan, are there any questions or uh, let's just end the session otherwise? One I think so has just... Uh... There's one question. Uh, yeah, it yeah. says, how can we learn more about cases? Uh, how can you learn more about cases? Okay, so uh, students are... Uh, a lot of free cases are also available. If you can become, uh, as a student, you can become member of it. Uh, we, in, in India, there are uh, now cases have already uh, picked up, you know. Otherwise, Harvard cases are there. A lot of uh, Harvard cases are uh, Indian cases also, okay. I regularly write for uh, Ambrold uh, Emerging Market case because I write on India uh, and Indian cases. So that's again a nice uh, way from there you can get cases. They have teaching notes because we're supposed to prepare teaching notes when we're writing cases, which uh, are a, give you a deeper insight. And you know, at times there's solutions also of the case. But my recommendation is that you should try to solve the case on your own. First, because uh, when recruitment will start, a lot of companies will give you cases, okay? And uh, they'll expect you to solve it then and there. Or maybe, you know, these days, uh, you know, they expect you to give answers on videos, record, do the recording and send it to them. 
Okay, that's another common way that has started from last one and a half years. I see a lot of companies doing it. But you can get these cases on these platforms, which are free of cost. And in fact, you can become member free of cost uh, on these various platforms, right? So that's how you can get cases. Any other questions? Plus, uh, Harvard Business Review every uh, has one case which is solved also by leading professionals. That is also available. So you can probably get from there. And there's one more question: okay. that how do we overcome this so that we can effectively analyze the case properly? Uh, right. So the best way, as I said, is you can start with case. Let's see cases. Also, when you, you uh, dig uh, deep into cases, cases uh, start with caselets also, in, in, especially in psychology and all, you know, when we are doing personality cases or situational cases, which are half page also, even in marketing, you know, so they are referred as caselets. You can start with small uh, caselets right start solving them if you refer to books uh, uh, especially foreign authors and foreign publications they have these solutions also with solution cases are available okay so you can start uh, with case let's start solving it as i said it's both a technique and an art i've given you some insight on the techniques that we apply to solve a case art you will have to learn with practice okay that's a mindset that you need to develop a very analytical mindset okay creative mindset so keep solving it, start with small ones. And then um, a normal case that we teach at a business school, like at NDIM, we, we keep teaching a uh, lot of, you know, no subject um, is without cases. And uh, most of the organizations, as I said, you know, we have a lot of uh, recruiters like Arch and Bull and uh, Deloitte and all of them, when they come, they do give a lot of situational questions, which are, of course, replica of cases. So, um, a, a, a normal case would run into around 25 pages, 20, 25 pages. But once you become master doing caselets, you can always move to the next level. Okay. There's one saying that what are the skills we need to uh, develop for effectively solving the cases? Okay, so as I said, practice is one thing. Like, um, as I said, NDIM, we are known for solving a lot of cases. We write a lot of cases. We have, uh, you know, and when you, um, at our center, of course, we, we are members to a lot of uh, these uh, sites, which where we get paid cases and we uh, solve them, okay? So that's one thing. Another is... Um, of course, uh, in each and every area, I'm sure you can even interact with your faculty. Uh, you have tutorials. They can help you because that's the way we adopt uh, at uh, our campus, at NDIM. Uh, it's mandatory in every subject to solve cases, plus uh, evaluation, we have made it mandatory. So uh, practice, what I want to say is yes. practice is something that makes you perfect. And that's exactly what we do at uh, NDIM making you, you know, go again and again and again uh, talking about it. Thank so you, ma'am. Actually, it was a great insightful session. And I personally liked it a lot and how to approach and analyze the case study. So thank you for that. And I will hand it over to Manika, ma'am, for a vote of thanks. Thank you, Shivani, ma'am. You know, one thing which uh, actually interested me is I've attended a lot of workshops on case study analysis, and all of them have taught us that do not presume anything beyond the case. Okay, and uh, yours was a very fresh take on it that we can make presumptions, we can make, uh, read between the lines as well. Uh, so I think that opens a house for creativity uh, from uh, among the students as well. Okay. The end of the story is the beginning of many, and I'm sure we have uh, more such uh, sessions coming over. Thank you, Dr. Shivani, for this extremely enriching learning experience from such an unfortunate uh, accident. I'm very certain that uh, the session has benefited the students and the faculty attendees alike. Key takeaways from the session were inquisitive mindset or perspective to solve a case, no standard answers, and being creative by solving the cases and the like. Thank you once again, uh, Shivani ma'am, and we hope uh, we have more such sessions in the future and more on an offline platform. Yes, I am even looking forward <laughs> to interacting, you know, meeting new people and uh, interacting. Uh. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, we would like to take this opportunity to thank NDIM for hosting us at ARSD College. And we are thankful to respected principal, sir, Dr. Vinita Tuli, IQAC co uh, coordinator, for allowing us this wonderful opportunity. 
Our thanks are also due to the live, lovely, lively, and interactive audience, majorly the students. Okay, thank you all, and we shall meet soon for such uh, intriguing sessions. Wish you all the best of health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was lovely having you. Thank you. Same here. Bye bye. Bye bye.